take your Bible because I want to speak to you about Gentile fullness. Uh, that's found actually one time in the whole Bible. It's in the New Testament book of Romans. Romans chapter 11 is where you should turn in your Bible this afternoon. Romans chapter 11. And I just want to read a few verses before we actually uh, jump into this. <clears throat> I want to begin with verse 25 of Romans 11. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery. Now, I'm sorry, I forgot to dismiss the children. <laughs> See, I don't normally do this. Brother Dave does this. Thank you for remembering for me. Bye. See you guys. Okay. Let's uh, start over. <laughs> okay. So you got Romans 11. All right. Let me just remind you, when the Bible talks about a mystery, uh, what it means is that God here is revealing a truth that previously was unknown, okay? It wasn't revealed in Old Testament times. It wasn't revealed in the Jewish scriptures called the Tanakh, but it's being revealed now in the New Testament scriptures, all right? So that's what it means by a mystery. Well, let's see, what is this mystery? What is this new revelation that we're going to hear of? He said, I would not that you be ignorant of this mystery, lest you be wise in your own conceits. Now, he is talking primarily to believers that are non-Jewish, which is the bulk, really, of, of the believing church. Not that there are no Jewish believers, obviously, but predominantly the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is Gentile. He's talking to Gentile believers. <clears throat> Here's what I want you to know. Here's the mystery. That blindness in part, he's talking about spiritual blindness, Obviously, not physical. Blindness in part, partial blindness has happened to Israel, the whole nation, until, that is, this spiritual blindness upon the nation of Israel is temporary. It is until, notice, the fullness of the Gentiles become in. Now, there are two great expressions about Gentiles in the Bible. Two phrases, each that appear only one time in the New Testament. This one and another one that talks about the times of the Gentiles. This speaks of the fullness of the Gentiles. They are not the same thing, and they must never be confused. And so I'm going to explain very briefly what the time of the Gentiles refers to. It appears one time from the lips of Jesus in Luke 21, verse 24. And then I want to spend the rest of our time on this phrase, the fullness of the Gentiles here in Romans 11:25. 25. Before we go any further, let's go ahead and, and pause a moment and pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing us together this afternoon and on this special occasion that we especially remember that uh, Jesus did not stay in that tomb, that he rose on the third day. And we thank you that that is a fact and that we know, have a relationship with, and have in us a living Savior. Christ in us. He is our life, and we thank you for that, and we pray that as we look at this scripture portion, that you might bless it to our hearts, that you might, as the scripture says, cause us to not be ignorant, or that is, unknowledgeable, uh, not knowing the truth that is contained in this phrase, uh, the fullness of the Gentiles and the temporary spiritual blindness of the nation of Israel. We just thank you for revealing this truth and pray that it would uh, be used in our lives, not just to uh, beef up our knowledge, but that it would have 
a, a gracious effect upon us that we would want to uh, cooperate with you and participate with you in what you are seeking to do in the nations of this earth as well as in the nation of Israel. We pray it all for Jesus' sake. Amen. I said that uh, the other phrase, the times of the Gentiles, appears one time in our New Testament, and it is from the lips of Jesus, and it's Luke chapter 21. I'll read it to you. And verse 24, uh, he says, talking about that time that is called by Daniel, the time, uh, the, the um, uh, 70th week, uh, called by Jeremiah, the time of Israel or Jacob's trouble. Here's what he says. They shall fall, talking about the, the Jewish people, they shall fall by the edge of the sword. They shall be led away captive into all nations, and Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Actually, he's talking about the Roman uh, conquering of Jerusalem that took place in AD 70. Now, what I want to say about that phrase, the times of the Gentiles, is that it is totally about political dominance. Let me define that phrase for you. The times of the Gentiles, as Jesus uses, is a time period in which the nations of this world would rise to world domination and put Jerusalem under Gentile authority, okay? So that Jerusalem would not be under Israel's authority, but under the different nations that rise and fall. Notice also uh, not only the definition of this phrase, the times of the Gentiles, but I want you to also take into account the duration of it. It began with the national empire of King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, who exiled, conquered Jerusalem and the Jews, and he exiled the Judean kingdom to Babylon, and that began the Babylonian captivity that took place in 586 B.C. And this times of the Gentiles began then, but it continues all the way to the destruction of Antichrist One World Babylonian Empire, we could call it, which is destroyed at the Messiah's glorious second coming when Jesus himself assumes the right to the throne of David. So it began with Nebuchadnezzar, the times of the Gentiles, and it ends when Jesus comes back and establishes Jerusalem as his capital. Now, there's a, a, a deduction uh, that we can make here, uh, and that is that after the times of the Gentiles, God is going to reestablish Though the Gentiles, the nations of this earth, trample Jerusalem temporarily, there is going to be a time when Jerusalem again will come under Jewish control after the time of the, uh, of the Gentiles ends when Jesus sits on the throne of David. Okay, that's all I want to say about the times of the Gentiles. If you have questions about that afterwards, maybe we can chat. But what I want to focus on is Romans 11 and verse 25 and talk about the fullness now, the fullness of the Gentiles. And may I begin by saying this, the fullness of the Gentiles has nothing to do with political dominance. The fullness of the Gentiles, rather, is all about spiritual blessing, okay? So the fullness of the Gentiles is about spiritual blessing on the nations. Now, let's look at the context here. And, uh, some, uh, let me just say right off the top that uh, I believe this in the past, and some uh, interpret this phrase, the fullness of the Gentiles, to mean that God is going to release Israel from her spiritual blindness and hardness of heart when a certain number of Gentiles are saved, and when that number is reached, then God will step in 
and will release the Jewish people or the nation of Israel, I should say, from their spiritual blindness. But the context doesn't say that. The context of this 11th chapter reveals that this is not about a special number of Gentiles, a certain amount of Gentiles being saved, but it is rather, it's about spiritual blessing because predominantly Gentiles or the nations populate the church currently. The minimum population is Jewish people. The predominant population of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is from the nations. I want you in context to see this. Go back to chap in, in chapter 11. Go back to verse 12 with me. In fact, go back to verse 11. Here's what Paul says. He says, I say then, have they, they meaning the Jewish people, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid. By that he means... Have they fallen away from God so that they are irretrievable, that God could never bring them back to faith? He says, perish that thought, God forbid. But rather, notice this, through their fall, that is, through the fall of the Jewish people in rejecting their Messiah, through their fall, Salvation is come unto the Gentiles or the nations. By the way, that word Gentiles, wherever it appears, we get our word ethnic from it. It's the word ethnos, and it refers to nations. So you should think about that. The nations, people from the nations. It says through the Jewish people, through their fall, Salvation is come unto the Gentiles for to provoke them, that is the Jewish people, to jealousy. Look at verse 12. Now, if the fall of them, if the, if the fall from that uh, privileged spiritual position of the Jews led to the riches of the nations of the world and the diminishing of the Jewish people spiritually, led to the riches of the nations, the Gentiles, well, how much more their fullness? See the word fullness, the last word in verse 12? Yeah. It's the same word translated fullness in verse 25. And so I want to keep the meaning of that in its context. And so fullness in verse 12 doesn't refer to the Gentiles, but to the Jews. See that? talking about the fullness of the Jews and how their, uh, if, if them being diminished spiritually has blessed the world and the nation so greatly, well, what's going to happen when the Jews are reach their fullness, reach the fullness of, of spiritual blessing from God? In fact, what we have in verse 12 is actually a contrast. The word fullness is the word pleroma, and it means that, that which fills. And it is in contrast to what he says in that verse of them falling and being diminished. When he talks about Israel falling and being diminished, he's referring to the fact that Israel was driven out of Jerusalem by the Romans in AD 70, and they were dispersed or scattered all over the world. And when that dispersion took place, the Jewish people were not diminished numerically. In fact, they continued to increase numerically, even despite the Holocaust. So fullness is not talking about numbers. It's talking about spiritual blessing. And it's characteristic that fullness is not about quantity. Fullness is about quality, about spiritual richness. And what we are, uh, what we are taught is that Israel, through their fall, through their diminishing, they lost their quality. They lost the, the richness of their relationship with God. 
They still possess the outward trappings of the law and the traditions, but they lost the, the richness of a heart relationship with the God of Israel that uh, would cause what we talked about this morning, that holy heartburn in them. And uh, they lost the, the radiant face that would glow with the love of God and the beauty of God and the grace and character of God. So fullness refers to spiritual richness or spiritual blessing. And what we are to understand from this verse is while that has subsided, as far as the Jewish people as a nation are concerned, they are going to one day enter into that fullness again. That spiritual rich, richness is to be restored to Israel yet in the future. So that's the context of verse 25. That's the meaning of the word fullness, I believe, there in verse 12, and also here in verse 25. Let me explain what I mean. Based on the context, you get the meaning of what Gentile fullness is. Based upon what Jewish fullness meant, we get an idea of what Gentile fullness means in verse 25 when he says that blindness is temporary concerning the, the Jewish nation, that their blindness spiritually is a temporary thing and it will be removed, it says, when the fullness of the Gentiles come in. Remember, the word Gentiles is the same word that could be translated nations. And as I said a moment ago, the Gentile uh, church is full of spiritual, it is supposed to be full of spiritual richness that would awaken the Jews to jealousy. Look at verse 14 for a moment. Uh, well, he says it there in verse 11 that, uh, that God has diminished the Jewish nation so that through their fall, salvation would come to the Gentiles to provoke them to jealousy. Verse 14, Paul says, if by any means I may provoke to emulation or jealousy them, meaning the Jewish nation, which are my flesh, and might save some of them. And so uh, the Gentile church, full of spiritual richness, is supposed to arouse Jewish jealousy. God turns to the nations, God turns to uh, the, the, the Gentiles to arouse Jewish jealousy, to arouse and awaken the Jewish people. Now, think about that in light of the phrase, the fullness of the Gentiles. If it refers to spiritual blessing, then the fullness of the Gentiles is about spiritual privilege. Remember, the word fullness means that which fills. It's about spiritual privilege because currently the blessing the spiritual privilege rests in a predominant Gentile church. It rests in the church as a whole, but predominantly in a Gentile church. And so it, the fullness refers to spiritual blessing that is given to people that are saved out from among the nations. Because the fact of the matter is, according to Romans 11, God has temporarily removed Israel from that place of spiritual privilege of the, the spiritual most favored nation status, and he has shifted the center of spiritual influence from Jerusalem to Gentile cities when you read the book of Acts and you read the New Testament. Uh, it moves from Jerusalem to Antioch, to Ephesus, to uh, Philippi, to uh, uh, Rome, and all of these other Gentile cities, which really fulfills prophecy, ancient prophecy, way back in Genesis chapter 9, uh, Noah, when he awakes from that stupor, uh, he gives a far-reaching prophecy about his three sons. His third son, Shem, is the 
one that is the ancestor of all of the Jewish people. They are the descendants of Shem. And in Genesis 9, 27, Noah in this prophecy says that Japheth will dwell in the tents of Shem. And what that means is that Gentile descendants of Noah's son Shem will be spiritually blessed by Shem's descendants, i.e. the Jewish people. And that is exactly what Peter, uh, Peter's words that are referred to in Acts 15 really means. Listen to this. This is Acts 15, and this is that Jerusalem council, and verse 14, where James says, Simeon, or Peter, hath declared how God at first did visit the Gentiles, the nations, to take out of them a people for his name. Peter had stood up just uh, before that, and in verse 7 of Acts 15, he rose up and he said, men and brethren, you know that a good while ago God made choice among us that the nations, the Gentiles, by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And he was referring, of course, to that Italian band leader, uh, Cornelius. Remember that? In Acts chapter 10. And so this is what the fullness refers to. The fullness of the Gentiles is about spiritual privilege that currently rests in a predominantly Gentile church. And uh, But here's the plan. Here's the genius behind it. He says, blindness has happened in part to Israel until this fullness is complete, until that which fills is filled up. So the plan is uh, really, when you think about it, there is not much about the Gentile believer or church that's predominantly Gentile that would stand to awaken Jews to jealousy, right? Not a whole lot of that. In fact, in the name of Christianity, it, it, uh, the Jewish people have often been oppressed. They've been persecuted. They've been mistreated by the Gentile church or by professing Christians. But this verse has become extremely encouraging to me and, uh, and has offered me a lot of hope <laughs> because what it's telling us is that prior to the second coming of the Messiah, that's when he will come and Israel's blindness, spiritual blindness will be removed. And it says it in the next verse, all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion, out of uh, 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 Jerusalem, Mount Zion in Jerusalem, the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob, for this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. When you put that all together, you see the plan here. It's, it's just amazing that uh, prior to the second coming of the Messiah, where he will come as Israel's deliverer, this church that is predominantly consisting of people saved out from among the nations will be enriched with such spiritual blessing it'll peak so that the Jews will want what they see in them and it will set up Israel for that prophesied spiritual restoration that God promises them in covenant with them. When this happens, it indicates a time that God will shift his focus from the Gentiles back to the Jewish people. And if you study it out, you'll find that during that 70th week of Daniel, it is predominantly Jewish evangelists that are evangelizing the Gentile, the nations of the world. So, I'm encouraged, I said, and hopeful by this, because I see a spiritual fullness. I see a spiritual blessing that uh, is increasing and growing even at this very time in our world. I think there's a 
there's evidence of a current foretaste of this fullness of the Gentiles, of this growing uh, spiritual blessing of, of, of people from all the nations coming to Christ. Despite the increasing evil that we see in our world, the Bible says that in the last days, evil times will increase and evil doers will increase. But the Bible also says that in the same last days, he will pour out his spirit upon all flesh. And so I, it, as bad as it gets, the Holy Spirit of God as well is at work. And I see in many parts of the world this very thing happening. For instance, I think that God, in answer to the prayer of his people, has uh, been working in his own way and taking them where they're at in, the, in Generation Z. Uh, for example, last year, that Asbury uh, University revival, that has uh, not only touched them, but it touched the University of Alabama, it touched uh, uh, secular universities, the University of Oklahoma, and uh, many others. There's a stirring among Generation Z, and I think that God is, is calling out and bringing about this fullness. I could also... Uh, share some uh, quick statistics from, I don't know if you ever heard of the Joshua Project, but the Joshua Project has some really encouraging and wonderful uh, information and statistics about uh, uh, what's going on in the world. So put that up, if you will. We'll start with a, a slide, and some of them I'll just uh, I'll uh, have you just uh, go through them. Notice this. Uh, here's uh, some of the world's religions based on population. Evangelicals are growing faster than Islam, and Islam is a fast-growing religion, as we all know. But evangelicals are growing faster. I'm not talking about Christianity isn't. See, Christianity is here. Christianity is a big, wide umbrella, and uh, it includes true believers and people that just say they're Christians. But true Bible-believing Christians are called evangelicals. They're way up here and have surpassed even the growth of Islam. Next slide. There's amazing growth of Christ followers worldwide. Next slide. Amazing advance of the gospel globally. An estimated 50,000 people become Christ followers every day. About 35,000 churches are planted every week around the world. Now, don't think of a church like we would, but we're talking about a small group in a house. Um, evangelicals worldwide in 65, 90 million, currently 680 million. Uh, they were not 4%, 4 now they're almost 10%. Next slide. There's a remarkable growth of, uh, of believers in China. In 1949, less than 1 million in China. Today, they estimate 80 to 100 million true believers in the, in the country of China. Next slide. Remarkable growth in Iran. In 1979, 500 known Christ followers. Today, estimates suggest a possibility of 1 million Christ followers in the country of Iran. Next slide. Remarkable growth in Mongolia. In 1989, there were only 10 known believers in Mongolia. Today, estimates of 60 to 80,000. Next slide. Uh, skip it. Skip it. Uh, skip it. Skip it. Okay. Um, the rise of Global South as a center of, uh, of Christianity. Now skip that. Uh, new faces, the body of Christ. For every one Christ follower in the U.S. and Europe, there are 16 in Latin America, Africa, and Asia. Next slide. The harvest field is becoming the harvest force. The majority of missionaries aren't coming from America anymore, aren't coming from the British Isles anymore, aren't coming from Western Europe. They're coming from the 1040 window. They're coming from 
uh, this uh, Asia and uh, Latin America and Africa. Next slide. Uh, next slide. Next slide. Uh, Muslim movement to Christ. The greatest turning of Muslims to Christ in history is occurring today. Did you know that? Uh, there's remarkable movements in Indonesia. 80,000 new church houses in the last few years. Some movements report 20 generations of multiplying house churches. Over 15% of Indonesians are now Christ followers. And that is the number one Muslim populated country in the world. Next slide. Five great uh, positive trends. Amazing growth of Christ followers. Acceleration of Bible translation. Um, harvest field becoming the harvest force. And the growth of people group movements to Christ. Next slide. Is that it? That's it. Okay. Thanks. I hope that's encouraging to you. That's not something you'll ever find in the mainstream news media. Uh, in fact, a lot of even Christian uh, news sites won't give you that information. I challenge you. Look at the Joshua Project. It, it From time to time, it may encourage your heart to see that some of the bad news that we're getting over and over again doesn't mean that God's not at work at the same time. In the very centers where a lot of evil is happening, a lot of good is happening, too. I've heard some good reports uh, of God moving in hearts in Gaza, as well as in Israel itself. And so I want us to be encouraged. I want us to realize that God is blessing the nations of this earth because the spiritual blessing and privilege of the Gentiles is the fullness of the Gentiles, that uh, is happening so that Jesus can, again, shift his focus from Gentiles, from the nations, to the Jewish nation that has been temporarily blinded. So that, I hope, will encourage you. But let me also encourage you to pray. That you would pray for God to revive your heart and mind that you would pray for God to stir our hearts and to put us in a right relationship with him. We talked about holy heartburn this morning. We talked about the need for spiritual burning hearts. Hearts that are hungry for God. Hearts that are hungry to see God work, to see God move, to see God revive us, his church. Because it is a revived church that then overflows and brings the nations, Jew and Gentile, to the Lord. And so let's pray for that. Be fervent. It says, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. And it gives Elijah as an example who prayed that it wouldn't rain and it didn't rain. You know why he prayed that? Not because he thought it up, but because God previously came to him and said, Elijah, I'm going to shut up the heavens here in Israel, and I'm not going to have it rain for three and a half years. And so then it says that he prayed that God would cause it to rain at the end of the three and a half years. And sure enough, it rained. But you know why he prayed that? Because God came to him and said, Elijah, Pray now for rain, and I'm going to send it. And so he did. So let me ask you, do you have any indication in the word of God, is there anything that we can point to that can promise spiritual rain upon our nation and upon the nations of this world? Is there any indication of that promise? I say there is, and I know that I have shared this with us in the past, but I'm going to share it again in closing. Peter, on that wonderful day of Pentecost, the fulfillment of that feast, he stands up and he says, you know what's happening? You know what this is? He says, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last day, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens, 
I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. That is a promise that was made, and notice, to take place during the last days, which is what we live in now. It was then, and it is now. You say, but that was given to them in their day. Well, drop down with me, if you would, to uh, verse 33. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, meaning Jesus, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he hath shed forth this, or poured out his Spirit, which you now see and hear. And then he says this in verse 39. For the promise, that is the pouring out of the Spirit, the promise is unto you, meaning you Jewish believers, and then to your children, future generations of Jewish believers, and to all who are afar off, that is, to Gentile believers. And then he says, even as many as the Lord our God shall call, to all believers. It's a promise to all believers, all generations, all the time during the last days. So what I'm saying is, start claiming that promise. Claim that promise that we might see the fullness of the Gentiles come in. That we might see the spiritual privilege and blessing that God intends to bring upon the nations of this earth that will then cause the Messiah to come as deliverer. And that blindness taken from Israel. And also, all Israel will be saved. 